Hi, Dr. Alex here, and welcome to what I hope will be an enjoyable series to many people, although it may be of niche interest. Specifically, this series is transcribing the audiobooks of Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Life, the Universe, and Everything, and So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, as read by Stephen Moore. Stephen Moore, for those who don't know, is the actor who played Marvin the Paranoid Android on the original radio production of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the TV series which followed soon after. This is the genuine Marvin the Paranoid Android, except no substitutes. When the radio series first aired in 1979, I was about five years old, and it was then repeated multiple times over several years on Radio 4, when it was first broadcast. My father was an avid fan of Hitchhikers as soon as it was produced, had the books, which I still have copies of, and listened to the radio series repeatedly, as did I growing up, to the point where I think I overtook my father in terms of my fandom for the series and would insist that we listen to it whenever it was on, on a Saturday usually, around about lunchtime, and it just had to be on in the background so I could listen to it. Later, in school, having consumed the radio series multiple times and the books, I discovered the audiobooks in the school library, as read by Stephen Moore. And of course, I got these out and listened to them repeatedly as long as I could. Obviously, I had to take them back. They were, after all, library books on tape. Recently, I got to thinking about these books on tape and how enjoyable they were. Being read by Stephen Moore, it had the voice of Marvin the Paranoid Android whenever he read the Marvin lines. And of course, the correct voice for the other characters that he also read in the radio series. And simply as a narrator, he has an excellent reading voice. So I remembered how much I enjoyed those as a child and then thought, I wonder if they're still readily available. As it turns out, they are not. They have never been produced on DVD or online. They only exist in that original tape form. And those tapes themselves are incredibly hard to find, as I discovered as I attempted to dig them out online from various shops and sources. I have now got all but one of the books. And hopefully by the time I get to the last book that Stephen Moore read, I should have all the tapes available. I would like to stress, I do not own the copyright for these tapes. I do not own the copyright for the original material, and I'm recording them in these videos in an effort to preserve them, because they are on magnetic tape, magnetic tape degrades, and there aren't very many of them left around as far as I can see, and there's been no effort to reproduce these professionally in another format, either online, digitally, or even just on CD. So if you do own the copyright for these, please, by all means, copyright claim these videos as the material is your own, but I would request humbly that you do not block them, just monetize them. My channel isn't monetized, so I'm not going to make money from this anyway, but I would like people, future generations, to be able to access these amazing recordings and enjoy Stephen Moore's work long into the future. Anyway, enough about my motivations for doing this, and now here is The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, cassette side one. There is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is another theory which states that this has already happened. The story so far. In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry and been widely regarded as a bad move. Many races believe that it was created by some sort of god though the Jatravartid people of Viltvodal VI believed that the entire universe was in fact sneezed out of the nose of a being called the Great Green Arkel Seizure. The Jatravartids, who live in perpetual fear of the time they call the coming of the Great White Handkerchief, are small blue creatures with more than 50 arms each, who are therefore unique in being the only race in history to have invented the aerosol deodorant before the wheel. However, the Great Green Arkel Seizure Theory is not widely accepted outside Viltvodal VI, and so, the universe being the puzzling place it is, other explanations are constantly being sought. For instance, a race of hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings once built themselves a gigantic supercomputer called Deep Thought to calculate once and for all the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. 
For seven and a half million years, Deep Thought computed and calculated and in the end announced that the answer was in fact 42. And so another, even bigger computer had to be built to find out what the actual question was. And this computer, which was called the Earth, was so large that it was frequently mistaken for a planet, especially by the strange ape-like beings who roamed its surface, totally unaware that they were simply part of a gigantic computer program. And this is very odd, because without that fairly simple and obvious piece of knowledge, nothing that ever happened on the Earth could possibly make the slightest bit of sense. Sadly, however, just before the critical moment of readout, the Earth was unexpectedly demolished by the Vogons to make way, so they claimed, for a new hyperspace bypass, and so all hope of discovering a meaning for life was lost forever. Or so it would seem. Two of these strange, ape-like creatures survived. Arthur Dent escaped at the very last moment because an old friend of his, Ford Prefect, suddenly turned out to be from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Betelgeuse, and not from Guildford, as he had hitherto claimed. And more to the point, he knew how to hitch rides on flying saucers. Tricia Macmillan, or Trillian, had skipped the planet six months earlier with Zaphod Beeblebrox, the then president of the galaxy. Two survivors. They are all that remains of the greatest experiment ever conducted to find the ultimate question and the ultimate answer of life, the universe, and everything. And less than half a million miles from where their starship is drifting lazily through the inky blackness of space, a Vogon ship is moving slowly towards them. Like all Vogon ships, it looked as if it had not been so much designed as congealed. Uglier things have been spotted in the skies, but not by reliable witnesses. In fact, to see anything much uglier than a Vogon ship, you would have to go inside it and look at a Vogon. One thing Vogons don't like is leaving a job unfinished, particularly this Vogon, and particularly, for various reasons, this job. This Vogon was Captain Prostetnik Vogon Jeltz of the Galactic Hyperspace Planning Council, and he it was who had had the job of demolishing the so-called planet Earth. He heaved his monumentally vile body round in his ill-fitting slimy seat and stared at the monitor screen on which the starship Heart of Gold was being systematically scanned. It mattered little to him that Zaphod Beeblebrox was aboard. Zaphod Beeblebrox was now the ex-president of the galaxy, and though every police force in the galaxy was currently pursuing both him and this ship he had stolen, the Vogon was not interested. He had other fish to fry. Computer, get me my brain gas specialist on the line. Within a few seconds, the face of Gag Halfrunt appeared on the screen. Though the Vogon persistently referred to him as my private brain care specialist, there was not a lot of brain to take care of, and it was in fact Halfrunt who was employing the Vogon. He was paying him an awful lot of money to do some very dirty work. Well, hello, my captain of Vogon's prosthetic, and how are we feeling today? The Vogon captain told him that in the last few hours he had wiped out nearly half his crew in a disciplinary exercise. Well, I think this is perfectly normal behavior for a Vogon, you know? The natural and healthy channeling of the aggressive instinct into acts of senseless violence. That is what you always say. Well, again, I think that this is perfectly normal behavior for a psychiatrist. Good. We are clearly both very well adjusted in our mental attitudes today. Now tell me, what news of the mission? We have located the ship. The Earthman is there and a female from the same planet. They are the last. Good, good. Who else? The man Prefect. Yes? And Zaphod Beeblebrox. Ah, yes. I had been expecting this. It is most regrettable. Beeblebrox, you know, is one of my most profitable clients. He has personality problems beyond the dreams of analysts. Still, you are ready for your task? Yes. Good. Destroy the ship immediately. 
What about Bilbo Brooks? Well, they thought just this guy, you know. He vanished from the screen. The Vogon captain pressed a communicator button which connected him with the remains of his crew. Attack! At that precise moment, Zaphod Beeblebrox was in his cabin swearing very loudly. Star pox! At that same precise moment, Ford Prefect burst into Zaphod's door and explained what was on his mind. Vogons! A short while before this, Arthur Dent had set out from his cabin in search of a cup of tea. It was not a quest he embarked upon with a great deal of optimism because he knew that the only source of hot drinks on the entire ship was a benighted piece of equipment produced by the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation. It was called a Nutrimatic Drink Synthesizer, and he had encountered it before. Listen, you m machine, you claim you can synthesize any drink in existence, so why do you keep giving me the same undrinkable stuff? That drink was individually tailored to meet your personal requirements for nutrition and pleasure. Ah, so I'm a masochist on a diet, am I? Share and enjoy. Oh, shut up. Will that be all? Arthur decided to give up and wandered up to the bridge. In the empty wastes of space, the heart of gold hung still. Around it blazed the billion pinpricks of the galaxy. Towards it crept the ugly yellow lump of the Vogon ship. Vogons, snapped Ford. We're under attack. Well, what are you doing? Let's get out of here. Can't. Computer's jammed. Jammed? It says all its circuits are occupied. There's no power anywhere in the ship. Ford moved away from the computer terminal, wiped a sleeve across his forehead, and slumped back against the wall. Nothing we can do, he said. Arthur cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Tell me... Did the computer say what was occupying it? I just ask out of interest. What have you done to it, monkey man? Well, nothing, in fact. It's just that I, I think a short while ago it was trying to work out how to... Yes? Make me some tea. That's right, guys. Just coping with that problem right now, and wow, it's a biggie. Be with you in a while. As if to relieve the tension, the Vogons chose that moment to start firing. The ship shook. The ship thundered. Outside, the inch-thick foreshield around it blistered, crackled and spat under the barrage of a dozen 30 megahertz definite-kill Fotrazon cannon and looked as if it wouldn't be around for long. Four minutes is how long Ford Prefect gave it. Dying for a cup of tea, eh? Three minutes and forty seconds. Will you stop counting? Yes, said Ford Prefect, in three minutes and thirty-five seconds. Aboard the Vogon ship... Prostetnik Vogon Jeltz was puzzled. He had expected a chase. He had expected an exciting grapple with tractor beams, but the Heart of Gold just sat there and took it. He tested every sensor at his disposal to see if there was any subtle trickery afoot, but no subtle trickery was to be found. He didn't know about the tea, of course. Quite how Zaphod Beeblebrox arrived at the idea of holding a seance at this point is something he was never quite clear on. You want to talk to your great-grandfather? Yeah. Listen, Ford, I think he may be able to help us. Okay, round the central console. Now, come on. Trillion, monkey man, move! They clustered round the central console in confusion, sat down, and, feeling exceptionally foolish, held hands. With his third hand, Zaphod turned off the lights. Darkness gripped the ship. Outside, the thunderous roar of the definite kill cannon continued to rip at the force field. Concentrate on his name. Well, what is it? Zaphod Beeblebrox the Fourth. The Fourth? Yeah. Listen, I am Zaphod Beeblebrox. My father was Zaphod Beeblebrox the Second. My grandfather, Zaphod Beeblebrox the Third. What? There was an accident with a contraceptive and a time machine. Now concentrate. Three minutes. The only light on the bridge came from two dim red triangles in a far corner where Marvin, the paranoid android, sat slumped, ignoring all and ignored by all, in a private and rather unpleasant world of his own. On Zaphod's brows stood beads of sweat. At last he let out a cry of anger, snatched back his hands from Trillian and Ford, and stabbed at the light switch. 
Uh, I was beginning to think you'd never turn the lights on. No, uh, not too bright, please. My eyes aren't what they once were. Four figures jolted upright in their seats. Now, who disturbs me at this time? said the small, bent, gaunt figure, standing by the sprays of fern at the far end of the bridge. His two small, wispy-haired heads looked so ancient that it seemed they might hold dim memories of the birth of the galaxies themselves. Oh, uh, uh, hi, great-grandad. Ah, Zephod Beeblebrox, the last of our great line. Zephod Beeblebrox, the nothingth. The first? The nothingth. Uh, yeah, uh, look, I'm, I'm really sorry about the flowers. I meant to send them along, but you know the shop was fresh out of wreaths and you forgot. Two minutes, Zephod. Yeah, yeah, but I, I did mean to send them, and, and, and I'll write to my great-grandmother as well, just as soon as we get out of this, um, um, uh, how is she? Your late great-grandmother and I are very well, but very disappointed in you, young Zephod. We have been following your progress with considerable despondency. Yeah, look, uh, just at the moment, you see... Not to say contempt. Could you uh, sort of listen for a moment? I mean, what exactly are you doing with your life? I am being attacked by a Vogon fleet. Doesn't surprise me in the least. Only it's happening right now, you see? One minute thirty. Yeah, look, great granddad, can you actually help because... Help? You go swanning your way around the galaxy with your disreputable friends, too busy to put flowers on my grave. Plastic ones would have done, would have been quite appropriate from you, but no, too busy, too modern, too skeptical, till you suddenly find yourself in a bit of a fix and come over suddenly all astrally minded. Well, I don't know, young Zephod. I think I'll have to think about this one. One minute ten. Why does that man keep talking in numbers? Those numbers are the time we have got left to live. Oh, doesn't apply to me, of course. Great-grandfather, it applies to us. We are still alive, and we are about to lose our lives. Good job, too. What use is your life to anyone? When I think of what you made of it, the phrase pig's ear comes irresistibly to mind. But I was president of the galaxy, man. Ha! Huh. And what kind of a job is that for a Beeblebrox? Hey, what? Only president, you know, of the whole galaxy. Conceited little mega puppy. Forty-eight seconds. Now, Zephod, I don't know if you are really capable of succeeding in your job. I think you will not be able to avoid it. However, I am too long dead and too tired to care as much as I did. The principal reason I am helping you now is that I couldn't bear the thought of you and your modern friends slouching about up here. Understood? Yeah, uh, thanks a bundle. Oh, and Zephod, if you ever find you need help again, you know, if you're in trouble, need a hand out of a tight corner, please don't hesitate to get lost. Within the space of one second, a bolt of light flashed from the wizened old ghost's hands to the computer. The ghost vanished, the bridge filled with billowing smoke, and the heart of gold leapt an unknown distance through the dimensions of time and space. Ten light years away, Gag Halfrant jacked up his smile by several notches. As he watched the picture on his vision screen, he saw the final shreds of the heart of gold's force shield ripped away and the ship itself vanish in a puff of smoke. Good, he thought. The end of the last stray survivors of the demolition he had ordered on the planet Earth, he thought. The final end of this dangerous to the psychiatric profession and subversive also to the psychiatric profession experiment to find the question to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything, he thought. There would be some celebration with his fellows tonight, and in the morning they would meet again their unhappy, bewildered and highly profitable patients, secure in the knowledge that the meaning of life would not now be, once and for all, well and truly sorted out. He thought. Family's always embarrassing, isn't it? said Ford to Zephod as the smoke began to clear. He paused. He looked about. Where's Zephod? Arthur and Trillian looked about blankly. 
They were pale and shaken and didn't know where Zaphod was. Marvin, where's Zaphod? A moment later he said, Where's Marvin? The robot's corner was empty. The ship was utterly silent. It lay in thick black space. They consulted the computer. It said, I regret I have been temporarily closed to all communication. Meanwhile, here is some light music. They turned off the light music. They searched every corner of the ship in increasing bewilderment and alarm. Everywhere was dead and silent. Nowhere was there any trace of Zaphod or of Marvin. One of the last areas they checked was the small bay in which the Nutrimatic machine was located. On the delivery plate of the Nutrimatic drink synthesizer was a small tray on which sat three bone china cups and saucers, a bone china jug of milk, a silver teapot full of the best tea Arthur had ever tasted, and a small printed note saying, Wait. Ursa Minor Beta is, some say, one of the most appalling places in the known universe. Although it is excruciatingly rich, horrifyingly sunny, and more full of wonderfully exciting people than a pomegranate is full of pips, it can hardly be insignificant that when a recent edition of Play Being magazine headlined an article with the words, When you are tired of Ursa Minor Beta, you are tired of life, the suicide rate there quadrupled overnight. Not that there are any nights on Ursa Minor Beta. It is a west zone planet, which by an inexplicable and somewhat suspicious freak of topography consists almost entirely of subtropical coastline. By an equally suspicious freak of temporal relastatics, it is nearly always Saturday afternoon, just before the beach bars close. There is only one city on Ursa Minor Beta, and that is only called a city because the swimming pools are slightly thicker on the ground there than elsewhere. If you approach Light City by air, you will see why it has this name. Here the sun shines brightest of all, glittering on the swimming pools, shimmering on the white palm-lined boulevards, glistening on the healthy bronzed specks moving up and down them, gleaming off the villas, the hazy air pads, the beach bars, and so on. Most particularly, it shines on a building, a tall, beautiful building, consisting of two thirty-story white towers connected by a bridge halfway up their length. The building is the home of a book and was built here on the proceeds of an extraordinary copyright lawsuit fought between the book's editors and a breakfast cereal company. The book is a guidebook, a travel book. It is, of course, that invaluable companion for all those who want to see the marvels of the known universe for less than thirty Altarian dollars a day, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If on this particular day, afternoon, stretch of evening time, call it what you will, you had approached the second pavement cafe on the right, you would have seen Zaphod Beeblebrock sitting and looking very startled and confused. The reason for his confusion was that five seconds earlier he had been sitting on the bridge of the starship Heart of Gold. Where the hell was he? How had he got there? Where was his ship? He fished in his pocket for his two pairs of sunglasses. In the same pocket he felt a hard, smooth, unidentified lump of very heavy metal. He pulled it out and looked at it. He blinked at it in surprise. Where had he got that? He returned it to his pocket and put on the sunglasses, annoyed to discover that the metal object had scratched one of the lenses. He relaxed, but only a little bit. Hello, yes, Megadodo Publications, home of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the most totally remarkable book in the whole of the known universe. Can I help you? Said the large pink-winged insect into one of the seventy phones lined up along the vast chrome expanse of the reception desk in the foyer of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy offices. What? Yes, I passed on your message to Mr. Zaniwoop, but I'm afraid he's too cool to see you right now. He's on an intergalactic cruise. Yes, he is in his office, but he's on an intergalactic cruise. Thank you so much for calling. It slammed down the phone. Zaphod Beeblebrox entered the foyer. He strode up to the insect receptionist. Okay, where's Zarniwoop? Get me Zarniwoop. Well, 
Elsa, if you could be a little cool about it. Look, I'm up to here with cool, okay? I'm so amazingly cool, you could keep a side of meat in me for a month. I'm so hip, I have difficulty seeing over my pelvis. Now, will you move before I blow it? Well, if you let me explain, sir, I'm afraid that isn't possible right now, as Mr. Zani will be on an intergalactic cruise. Hell. When is he going to be back? Back, sir? He's in his office. This cat's on an intergalactic cruise in his office? Listen, Three Eyes, don't you try to outweird me. I get stranger things than you free with my breakfast cereal. Well, just who do you think you are, honey? Zaphod Bieberbrox or something? Count the heads. You are Zaphod Bieberbrox. Yeah, but don't shout it out or they'll all want one. The Zaphod Bieberbrox? No, just a Zaphod Bieberbrox. Didn't you hear? I come in six packs. But, sir, I, I just heard on the sub-ether radio report it, it said you were dead. Yeah, that's right. I just haven't stopped moving yet. Now, where do I find Zarny Whoop? Well, sir, his office is on the 15th floor, but... But he's on an intergalactic cruise. Yeah, yeah. How do I get to him? The newly installed Sirius Cybernetics Corporation vertical people transporters are in the far corner, sir. But, sir, c can I ask you why you want to see you, Mr. Zarniwoop? Yeah. I told myself I had to. I just materialized out of thin air in one of your cafes as a result of an argument with the ghost of my great-grandfather. No sooner had I got there than my former self, the one that operated on my brain, popped into my head and said, Go see Zarniwoop. I have never heard of the cat. That is all I know. That and the fact that I have got to find the man who rules the universe. Mr. Beeperbrock, sir, you're so weird. You should be in movies. Yeah, and you, baby, should be in real life. The insect paused for a moment to recover from its agitation and then reached out a tentacle to answer a ringing phone. A metal hand restrained it. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Can I help you? I doubt it. Well, in that case, if you'll just excuse me. No one can help me. Yes, sir. Well... Not that anyone's tried, of course. Is that so? Hardly worth anyone's while to help a menial robot, is it? I'm sorry, sir. If... I mean, where's the percentage in being kind or helpful to a robot if it doesn't have any gratitude circuits? And you don't have any? I've never had occasion to find out. Listen, you miserable heap of maladjusted metal. Aren't you going to ask me what I want? What... Do you want? I'm looking for someone. Zaphod Beeblebrox. He's over there. Then why did you ask me? I just wanted something to talk to. What? Pathetic, isn't it? Hey, Marvin. Marvin, how did you get here? I don't know. One moment I was sitting in your ship feeling very depressed. And the next moment I was standing here feeling utterly miserable. An improbability field, I expect. Yeah, I expect my great-grandfather sent you along to keep me company. Thanks a bundle, Grandad. So, how are you? Oh, fine. If you happen to like being me, which personally I don't. Yeah, yeah, said Zaphod as the elevator doors opened. Hello? I am to be your elevator for this trip to the floor of your choice. I have been designed by the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation to take you, the visitor, to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy into these their offices. Yeah, said Zaphod, stepping into it. What else do you do besides talk? I go up or down. Good. We're going up. Or down? Yeah. Okay. Up, please. Down is very nice. Good. Now, will you take us up? May I ask you if you've considered all the possibilities that down might offer you? Like what other possibilities? Well, there's the basement, the microfiles, the heating system, uh... Holy Zarquan! Did I ask for an existential elevator? What's the matter with the thing? It doesn't want to go up. I think it's afraid. Afraid? Of what? Heights? An elevator that's afraid of heights? No, of the future. The future? What does the wretched thing want, a pension scheme? 
At that moment, a commotion broke out in the reception hall behind them. From the walls around them came the sound of suddenly active machinery. We can all see into the future. It's part of our programming. Zephod looked out of the elevator. An agitated crowd had gathered round the elevator area, pointing and shouting. Every elevator in the building was coming down very fast. He ducked back in. Marvin, just get this elevator to go up, will you? We've got to get to Zarni Whoop. Why? I don't know, but when I find him, he'd better have a very good reason for me wanting to see him. At the fifteenth floor, the elevator doors snapped open quickly. Fifteenth? And remember, I'm only doing this because I like your robot. Zaphod and Marvin bundled out of the elevator, which instantly snapped its doors shut and dropped as fast as its mechanism would take it. Zaphod looked around warily. The corridor was deserted and silent and gave no clue as to where Zani Whoop might be found. All the doors that let off the corridor were closed and unmarked. They were standing close to the bridge which led across from one tower of the building to the other. You know something? More than you can possibly imagine. I am dead certain this building shouldn't be shaking. It was just a light tremor through the soles of his feet. And another one. Either they've got some vibro system for toning up your muscles while you work, or this building's being bombed. A roar cracked through the building. Who in the galaxy would want to bomb a publishing company? Suddenly, at the end of a corridor, leading at right angles from this one, he caught sight of a figure as it lunged into view, a man. He was short, stocky and weather-beaten, and his clothes looked as if they'd been twice round the galaxy and back with him in them. Zaphod shouted in his ear when he arrived, Do you know your building's being bombed? It suddenly stopped being light. Glancing round at the window to see why, Zaphod gaped as a huge, slug-like, gunmetal green spacecraft crept through the air past the building. Two more followed it. The government you deserted is out to get you, Zaphod. They've sent a squadron of Frogstar fighters. The man was pulling him back through a door. He went with him. With a searing whine, a small black spider-like object shot through the air and disappeared down the corridor. What was that? Frogstar Scout Robot Class A out looking for you. Get down. From the opposite direction came a larger black spider-like object. It zapped past them. And that was? A Frogstar Scout Robot Class B out looking for you. And that? A Frogstar Scout Robot Class C out looking for you. Hey, pretty stupid robots, huh? From over the bridge came a massive rumbling hum. A gigantic black shape was moving over it from the opposite tower, the size and shape of a tank. Holy photon! What's that? A tank. Frogstar Scout Robot Class D come to get you. Marvin... You see that robot coming towards us? I suppose you want me to stop it? Yeah. Whilst you save your skins? Yeah, get in there. Just so long as I know where I stand. The man tugged at Zaphod's arm, and Zaphod followed him off down the corridor. Marvin stood at the end of the bridge corridor. He was not in fact a particularly small robot, but he did, however, look pitifully small as the gigantic black tank rolled to a halt in front of him. The tank examined him with a probe. The probe withdrew. Out of my way, little robot. I'm afraid that I've been left here to stop you. You? Stop me? Go on. No, really, I have. What are you armed with? Gas. Guess? Um, laser beams? Marvin shook his head solemnly. No, too obvious. Uh, antimatter ray? Far too obvious. Yes, um, how about an electron ram? No, not one of those. Good, though, isn't it? Very good. I know. You must have one of those new Xantic Restructron Destabilized Xenon Emitters. No. Oh. 
then it must be uh, you're thinking along the wrong lines you're failing to take into account something fairly basic in the relationship between men and robots um i know is it just think they left me an ordinary menial robot to stop you a gigantic heavy-duty battle machine whilst they ran off to save themselves what do you think they would leave me with oh uh, uh something pretty damn devastating i should expect expect oh yes expect i'll tell you what they gave me to protect myself with shall i yes all right Nothing. Nothing? Nothing at all. Not an electronic sausage. Well, doesn't that just take the biscuit? Nothing, eh? Just don't think, do they? And me, with his terrible pain in all the diodes down my left side. Hell, that makes me... Angry! I think I'll smash that wall down! You ain't seen nothing yet! I can take out this floor too, no trouble! Hell's Bell! What a depressingly stupid machine. Zaphod and the as yet unnamed man lurched up one corridor, down a second, and along a third. With difficulty, they reached one of a number of totally anonymous unmarked doors and heaved at it. With a sudden jolt, it opened and they fell inside. Let me introduce myself. My name is Rooster, and this is my towel. Uh, hello, Rooster. Uh, do we just sit here or what? What do these guys out there want? You, Beeblebrox. They're going to take you to the Frog Star, the most totally evil world in the galaxy. Oh, yeah? They'll have to come and get me first. They have come and got you. Look out of the window. The ground's going away. Where are they taking the ground? They're taking the building. We're airborne. Clouds streaked past the office window. What have I done to deserve this? I walk into a building, they take it away. Hey, uh, where did you say this building was flying to? The Frog Star, the most totally evil place in the universe. Uh, do they have food there? Food? You're going to the Frog Star, and you're worried about whether they've got food? Without food, I may not make it to the Frog Star. Beeblebrox, have you any idea what's going to happen to you on the Frog Star? They're going to feed me? They're going to feed you into the total perspective vortex. The most savage psychic torture a sentient being can undergo. So, no food, huh? Listen, you can kill a man, destroy his body, break his spirit, but only the total perspective vortex can annihilate a man's soul. The treatment lasts seconds, but the effects last the rest of your life. You ever had a pan-galactic gargle blaster? This is worse. Phew! Beeblebrox, I will now do the job I was sent here to do. Zaphod looked up at him from where he was sitting in a corner, sharing unspoken thoughts with Marvin. The building will shortly be landing. When you leave the building, do not go out of the door. Go out of the window. Good luck, he added, and walked out of the door disappearing from Zaphod's life as mysteriously as he had entered it. Zaphod leapt up and tried the door, but Rooster had already locked it. He shrugged and returned to the corner. Two minutes later, the building crash-landed amongst the other wreckage. Zaphod was badly shaken by the crash. He lay for a while in the silent, dusty rubble to which most of the room had been reduced. He looked around the cracked and broken room. The wall had split round the door frame, and the door hung open. The window, by some miracle, was closed and unbroken. Eventually, stung by the continuous series of contemptuous looks that Marvin appeared to be giving him, he took a deep breath 
and clambered out onto the steeply inclined side of the building. Marvin followed him, and together they began to crawl slowly and painfully down the fifteen floors that separated them from the ground. About halfway down the side of the shattered building, they stopped to rest. Poor souls, said a deep ethereal voice in Zephod's ear. Twisting round violently to find the source of the voice nearly caused Zephod to fall off the building. He grabbed savagely at a protruding window fitting and cut his hand on it. He hung on, breathing heavily. The voice had no visible source whatsoever, but there was no one there. Zephod looked wildly about. Uh, hey, who are you? Where are you? I am Gargravar. I am the custodian of the total perspective vortex. Why don't I see you again at the bottom? Zephod nodded. Minutes later he clambered over the ripped and mangled foundations of the building, and once more removing his sunglasses, he dropped to the ground. Marvin joined him a moment or so later and lay face down in the dust and rubble, from which position he seemed disinclined to move. Ah, oh, there you are. Excuse me leaving you like that. It's just that I have a terrible head for heights. Hey, um, uh, why can't I see you? Why aren't you here? I am here. My body wanted to come, but it's a bit busy at the moment. So, you are to be put into the vortex, yes? Uh, well, this cat's in no hurry, you know. I, I can just slouch about and take in a look at the local scenery, you know? No, the vortex is ready for you now. You must come. Follow me. Ah, uh, yeah? And how am I meant to do that? I'll hum for you. Follow the humming. A soft keening sound drifted through the air, a pale, sad sound that seemed to be without any kind of focus. It was only by listening very carefully that Zaphod was able to detect the direction from which it was coming. Slowly, dazedly, he stumbled off in its wake. What else was there to do? The grey plain stretched before Zaphod, a ruined, shattered plain. The wind whipped wildly over it. Visible in the middle was the steel pimple of the dome. This, gathered Zaphod, was where he was going. This was the total perspective vortex. As he stood and gazed bleakly at it, a sudden inhuman wail of terror emanated from it, as of a man having his soul burnt from his body. Hey, uh, what was that? A recording of the last man who was put in the vortex, it is always played to the next victim, a sort of prelude. Hey, uh, it sounds really bad. Couldn't we maybe slope off to a party or something for a while, think it over? For all I know, I'm probably at one. Uh, my body, that is. It goes to a lot of parties without me. It says I only get in the way. Hey-ho. My name is Pizpot Gargravar. Come... I must take you to the vortex. You come from this hellhole pit, do you? No, no. I come from the Frogstar World Sea. Beautiful place. Wonderful fishing. I flit back there in the evenings, though all I can do now is watch. The total perspective vortex is the only thing on this planet with any function. It was built here because no one else wanted it on their doorstep. At that moment, another dismal scream rent the air, and Zaphod shuddered. What can do that to a guy? The universe, the whole infinite universe, the infinite suns, the infinite distances between them, and yourself, an invisible dot on an invisible dot, infinitely small. Hey, uh, I'm Zaphod Beeblebrock's man, you know? Gargravar made no reply, but merely resumed his mournful humming till they reached the tarnished steel dome in the middle of the plain. As they reached it, a door hummed open in the side, revealing a small, darkened chamber within. Enter. Uh, hey, uh, what now? Now. Zaphod peered nervously inside. The chamber was very small. It was steel-lined, and there was hardly space in it for more than one man. 
It, uh, uh, it, it doesn't look like any kind of vortex to me. It isn't. It's just the elevator. Enter. With infinite trepidation, Zaphod stepped into it. He was aware of Gargavar being in the elevator with him, though the disembodied man was not, for the moment, speaking. The elevator began its descent. I, uh, I must get myself into the right frame of mind for this. There is no right frame of mind. <laughs> you really know how to make a guy feel inadequate. I don't. The vortex does. At the bottom of the shaft, the rear of the elevator opened up, and Zaphod stumbled out into a smallish, functional, steel-lined chamber. At the far side of it stood a single upright steel box, just large enough for a man to stand in. It was that simple. It connected to a small pile of components and instruments via a single thick wire. Is that it? That is it. Oh, doesn't look too bad. And, uh, I get in there, do I? You get in there. And I'm afraid you must do it now. Okay, okay. He opened the door of the box and stepped in. Inside the box, he waited. After five seconds, there was a click, and the entire universe was there in the box with him. The door of the vortex swung open. Hi. People, Brox. Uh, could I have a drink, please? You... you have been in the vortex. You saw me, kid. And it was working? Sure was. And you saw the whole infinity of creation? Sure. Really neat place, you know that? And you saw yourself in relation to it all? Oh, yeah, yeah. But... What did you experience? Ah, uh, just told me what I knew all the time. I'm a really terrific and great guy. Didn't I tell you, baby? I am Zephard Bibelbrox. His gaze passed over the machinery which powered the vortex and suddenly stopped, startled. He breathed heavily. Hey, is that really a piece of fairy cake? He ripped the small piece of confectionery from the senses with which it was surrounded. If I told you how much I needed this, he said ravenously, I wouldn't have time to eat it. He ate it. 